Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every single day. Hello, I'm Stephen Willis from the Locked On Ole Miss podcast, and I'm joined by Derek Vandegrift. Why? Because baseball season starts this week, and we're going to do a little bit of a baseball preview, not necessarily about the Hawaii um, Warriors, but just as the Ole Miss baseball season as a whole, because Derek has been crushing it with his Dids in the Dugout podcast. He's interviewed like Andrew Fisher, who I think D1 baseball rated as the top college third baseman or something like that. Um, so I, I'm pretty fired up. So Derek, educate me. Tell me what I need to know about this Ole Miss baseball team. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, hope you cleared your schedule before this uh, because if you want me to get into this entire team, this is going to take a while. But what I can tell you is that a lot of people seem to be sleeping on Ole Miss this year, uh, you know, coming off the national championship. Obviously, last year didn't go our way. Uh, you know, injuries and such, stuff like that happened, obviously. Uh, but uh, Mike Bianco and Clem and Laugh, they went out and they hit the portal hard, had a really good recruiting class on top of that. Uh, and, and they bring back a lot of key guys that were freshmen last year that got a lot of really valuable experience for us that will be returning on top of these really talented transfers. Andrew Fisher being one of those that you have already brought up. Uh, B1 named the top 2025 MLB prospect in college for third base. Um, another one is Luke Hill, the transfer shortstop from Arizona State. Uh, a really good freshman year. For Arizona State last year transfers to Ole Miss. Uh, kind of my one of my favorite things about Luke Hill is the fact that he hit his first collegiate home run, even though he played at Arizona State down in Sharpeville, Mississippi against Mississippi State last year. Uh, I, I did let him know that uh, they're going to hate him a hell of a lot more this time if he does that during his Ole Miss career than they did when he was playing for Arizona State. So it'll probably be a little different reaction for him. Uh, but he he's another guy that everybody's super high on, and, and it's obvious to see why. He's a really good defender at shortstop. Uh, one, one of the first questions I asked him, which was the most important question when I had him on my show, was was he going to bring back the uh, blonde hair if he was the starting shortstop? And as we saw last week, he tweeted out, had it uh, dyed blonde. So he's he's keeping the tradition going there with the blonde hair. Um, so that's a guy we got at shortstop, just, just hits the ball. It's, it's one guy that Almost every single player that I interview brings up that just had a really good fall and, and spring going into this season. So a lot of guys to be really excited about, uh, transfers and returning starters alike. Um, you know, one thing that, that I harp on a lot in our, our podcast, uh, which I, I just did one with Chad Smith that uh, came out Wednesday morning, and, and we talked a lot about the pitching staff. That's that's what I'm really excited about. People have a lot of questions about it. Um, I don't have as many questions about the pitching staff. I think we are really, really solid. I, I think it's going to be one of the better staffs uh, as a whole when, when you take start and rotation, bullpen, everything combined that we've had in, in a number of years here in Oxford. We've got guys like JT Quinn, who I think is going to be an absolute stud on Friday nights for us. He's got all the, all the makings to be a true ace in the SEC. Uh, you know, obviously the unfortunate injury with Xavier Rivas, uh, a, a guy that would have been an absolute dude on Saturdays. That's really where he projects best at due to injuries and stuff. Last year, he was forced into that Friday night role. Still held his own pitch really well, probably our most consistent pitcher throughout the entire year. And then we returned Grayson Saunier, a uh, highly touted freshman that pitched a lot of innings for us last year. Um and, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing with Bianco. He's been doing this for 23 years in Oxford. And when you get high-level, high talented freshman arms that come in and pitch a ton of innings for him, that second year, that sophomore year, is usually a real big jump for them. You've seen it with guys like Gunnar Hoagland, Doug Nikhazy, Ryan Rollison, uh, you know, even Ryan uh, White Short. That was a guy that, that kind of came in a little bit later in his uh, tenure with Ole Miss as a freshman, pitched later in that season that turned out to be one of the Head arms we had on the staff here in his collegiate career as well. So uh, a lot of guys like that on this pitching staff, that was just a starting rotation. I don't know how deep you want me to get into it because I could probably go for a, a good 45 minutes on this bullpen, man. I'm so excited about the bullpen. It's it's one of the best that I can remember in Oxford. It's, it's really a weapon that Mike Bianco hasn't had in 
several years in Oxford with the death of this bullpen, all the weapons he has coming out of it. Uh, a lot of lefties. That's that's one thing we've really been lacking the last several years was having that guy to come in from the left side and, and get outs for us. And right now you look at a guy like Liam Doyle who transferred in from Coastal Carolina. Uh, he's not slated to be in the starting rotation right yet. Uh, it's a guy that I think can start if it comes to that. Uh, so we'll we'll see how the starting rotation works out, if he slides in it or not. But he's a big left. He pitched a lot of innings as a true freshman down in Coastal Carolina, transferred into uh, Ole Miss. And another guy's Wes Mendez, a freshman lefty that uh, has just absolutely been mowing folks down. He's an operated player overall in this recruiting class for us. And uh, from from all indications, look like justifiably so because he's he's pitched his tail off this this fall and spring as well. One more impressive, uh, one more impressive arms overall, but definitely the most impressive freshman we've had coming in. And it's just a bunch of guys like that in the bullpen. Then you return a guy like Josh Mallett, who I think has the single best pitch on the entire pitching staff with that slider. We saw that uh, you know he he can come in the game and he can change it immediately back in. Uh, 2022, his sophomore year, right, uh, that that led to that national championship. With, without him, without Mason Nichols, Ole Miss never gets to that point because we had to have that bridge to get to Brandon Johnson that year. Uh, and, and we finally found it with Nichols and Mallets. And having those two guys back, two guys that have uh, pitched a lot of baseball, pitched in Omaha, won a national championship, leading those guys. I think the bullpen's going to be lead. I think it's a real weapon that we haven't had in a really long time. And it's something that, that if you listen to Mike Bianco's press conference last Friday during the media days, you could tell he was pretty excited about all of those arms down there and, and all the options that he has. You know, um, that was an unbelievably thorough thing to get six minutes in and just kind of run through the whole team like that. I, that was impressive. Um, but Oh, I'm not done there, yet. No, no, I know, I know. Um, there's a left-handed pitcher out of Meridian Community College. He's a newcomer at Ole Miss. His last name, I think, is Dennis. Um, I'm having a brain mm-hmm. surgery Thunder type. Dennis. Um, Dennis. Talk about him. He looks like his fastball tops out at about 88 miles an hour. Is is he yeah. deceptive? What They say he might be the best pitcher on the staff right now. And whenever you talk about that velocity in an age where everything is about velocity, tell me why. Well, it's it's all about building up the strike zone, right? Uh, it's, it's it's one thing we talked about on our show a couple times already was uh, Mike Bianco did something a little different throughout this fall and spring going into the season. Instead of having radar guns up, he put the uh, uh, stat tracker uh, strike zone up, and, and that's what they went by because that's what the umpires are getting graded off of in the SEC is that stat tracker strike zone. Um, so he, he put that up to, to – to kind of encourage the guys to fill it up even more pitches you think might be a strike. Uh, you know, they, they look up there and it doesn't quite hit it. So, so it's more of an emphasis of filling up the strike zone. And from, uh, from Gunnar Dennis's perspective, it's not only filling it up, it's, it's being very deceptive, being able to throw multiple pitches for strikes, keeping hitters off balance, working both sides of the plate, uh, pitching always go back to Greg Maddox, right? Uh, which, which Greg was one of the best of all time, and, and he makes it sound really simple <clears throat> as long as he wasn't pitching to Tony Gwynn. He, he had some foul words for, for his battles with Tony Gwynn. He, he, he just couldn't get him out. But if you raise and lower the, the eyes of the batter in the batter's box, get them going north, south, east, west, where they can't settle on one, one certain area and, and also change speeds on top of that, then uh, it obviously makes it very difficult as a hitter to, to catch up to what you're doing as a pitcher. And, and that's kind of, you know, seems to be what gunner has got going on. He's throwing multiple pitches, throwing them for strikes, throwing them in different quadrants and locations, uh, really keeping these hitters off balance. He's another guy that the players I've interviewed have talked very highly about that's had a really, really good offseason leading into this year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it was either last weekend, weekend before, uh, Gunner threw an inner squad where he went four or five innings and punched out eight guys. You know, kind of like you said, that upper 80s, low 90s, fastball uh that's that's not really conducive to a high strikeout pitch but it's it just goes to show you that it's not all about velocity it's uh about overall stuff and and how you end up pitching with it and that's one thing that gunner seems to be doing a, a really good job at and we're going to get a good look at it this weekend in hawaii he's going to start one of the games in the saturday double header uh I, I think he's starting game two if i have that right grayson sonia starting game one 
maybe it's flip flop, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's game two starter. Uh, but you know, we'll we'll kind of see how he does in that start. And and more importantly for me, I'm I'm interested to get to a three game set, right? Because that's what baseball's played in three game series. Get me out of these double headers, four game weekends, and let me see what Mike Bianco's really thinking about with that weekend rotation. Because I think it's an absolutely fascinating conversation to have who the three guys should be in that in in, in a regular weekend rotation. I, I'm pumped about this four game set for Hawaii. Now it's going to be oh, yeah. first pitch is like at 11 o'clock at night. So I'm going to be checking out box scores um, for these baseball games. But um, a four game set means your bullpen is going to get taxed more so than it normally would, which means there's a good chance, in my opinion, I think we see Austin Simmons this weekend. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we're absolutely going to see him kind of, to your point, there's multiple arms there that you don't want to uh, put too much on your starters early in the year either, right? You don't want them to overextend themselves. You're, you're still really trying to get stretched out and into baseball shape. I know they've been playing, you know, since like October or November of last year, you know, getting ready for the season, but you really start getting stretched, you know, within the last three weeks to a month leading up to the year. Uh, so, so you don't want to overextend your starters, get them going too deep. Uh, and, and then to your point, the bullpen as well. Now, I, it's going to be fascinating to see how he handles the bullpen too because uh, I could sit here and rattle off, uh, you know, I, I, I actually sat down and wrote them down one day. There's 12, 13 names that I think can play a significant role in this bullpen come and get out for us. Austin Simmons obviously being one of them. I think he's an incredible, uh, incredible talent, obviously, a guy that plays uh, football baseball seems to be devoting most of his time to football but he's been out these last uh three four weeks with baseball trying to get ready uh trying trying to stretch that arm out a little bit you know he's got sitting 92 93 right now for the most part uh but can really run it up to about 95 or 96 if he if he needs to reach back for a little extra juice he can uh a curveball that uh you know it, it it projects to get better as he goes along it's uh, probably an average pitch right now, I would say. Uh, I, I can't remember who who uh, who said it, but uh, Laugh has already started working with him on tightening up that breaking ball. It's gone from more of a looping curveball that's, you know, low to mid-70s to a power curve that gets to about 80, 81. Uh, I, I think that's really going to help him. And then he's got a change up that obviously needs a little bit of work. But, you know, he's... 18 years old, just turned 18 years old, right? He's he, he's a really young kid, hadn't been out there with this baseball team during this entire offseason to get ready for uh, for this trip to Hawaii. But he's going to be out there. I think you're absolutely going to see him pitch, uh, especially with that doubleheader Saturday with, with arms you're probably going to go through because they've got just a ton of guys down there. They need to get work. Uh, you know, guys like Sam Takui and, and, and Braden Jones are probably names that you don't hear a lot of out of that bullpen. But guys that are going to play significant roles in my mind, uh, Takuyan and Jones both were true freshmen last year that came in. And, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, they got thrown to the wolves, man. Uh, you know, ideally you would let those guys work some midweek games, get their innings in that way. But from uh, the, the injuries we had on the pitching staff and lack of production out of the bullpen, uh, we just leave those two guys in there. And, and they really showed flashes of being really, really good pitchers, guys that can uh, really bridge the gap to get to, in this case, Josh Mallets and Mitch Morrell, uh, Mason Nichols, those guys that, that have pitched a ton of SEC innings in their own right at the back end of that bullpen. Uh, so Austin's just going to be another weapon in that bullpen, though, uh, also from the left-hand side. You know, we kind of mentioned earlier how much they put an emphasis on, on getting left-handed pitchers. So really excited to see what he's going to do, though, uh, you know, I, if, if it were my preference, I, I, I wish he would get in the game Friday because that appears to be the only game that's going to be on TV, and I'm absolutely going to stay up and watch it. Uh, you know, it may be up till 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, but I don't have anything going on Saturday, so I can I can have me a little bit of a late night if I need to. You know, um, this is an interesting thing. Whenever I started asking around, of course I ask around a lot on Austin Simmons just because of the two-sport thing, and I'm very interested in what's going on with him. But apparently, um, he's being taught how to pitch, essentially, as most true freshmen that get into college baseball are. And my understanding is they're leaning on a two-seam fastball with Austin um, that goes in the area of 93 to 94 miles an hour that gets up to there. But his four-seam fastball 
he can get that up and crank that up to 97, 98 miles an hour. But Mike Bianco is not going to call a lot of four seam fastballs because if it goes straight, it goes boom in college baseball. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and 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 look, a two seamer is uh is a really good pitch to have, especially for a young guy if you're able to control it. Um, you know, it's it's basically a hard changeup. You're going to get that 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 tail from from the arm side when when you throw it. So uh, he he can bury it into lefties and really tie them up, or he can run it away from righties. That's that's the one thing about the two seamers. If it's located correctly, you can use it against lefties or righties. It's 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 not a you know a a righty or lefty specific thing and especially when you can throw it as hard as he can so um you know again he's an incredibly talented pitcher i, I think they were saying he ended up finishing out his high school career not uh graduating early and, and enrolling you know they, they saw him as a top two to three round pick coming out of high school just because of his potential on the mound that's that's how special the arm is so uh yeah, give give Mike and the guys a little bit of time with him. Uh, I, I think it speaks volumes to his just God given talent that he's been out here four weeks, and you know you're probably going to see him on opening weekend to, to at least get his feet wet and, and see what he can do. You know, um, we talked about the transfers that came in. We talked about some newcomers that we might not be expecting. Who are some of the returning players that we probably should keep an eye on to make sure if they take a step? Is is it um Leger, is it um Groff? Is it Will Furnace or Boy? T t tell me what's going on from last year's guys. Yeah, so uh the, the guy to keep an eye on with the most upside, just overall upside, is Judd Udermark. Um, it's a guy that came in as a true freshman last year. He played for us, uh, battled injuries. That was his uh his bugaboo, if you will, dur during his freshman year. He was the one that won the Georgia series. Uh walking them off with the play at home plate, but he ended up uh, breaking his collarbone or something, having a shoulder injury there that ended up putting him out for the rest of the year. Uh, but guy with light power, power. I mean, you're talking Kemp Alderman level power production here. Uh, that, that's how far he can hit the ball. And from everything that I've heard and been told, uh, he might be the fastest guy on the team to boot. I mean, he can really, really run. He's uh Mike Bianco even pointed out that he could play all three outfield positions, including the field, which is pretty impressive for a six foot five, 220 pound uh, guy that can hit it into the parking lot with, you know, just, uh, just at any time. Um, but also, so he gonna play left? Reps. yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's my guess that he's going to be your starting left fielder to, to get things started. He, he, he's a guy you've got to get at bats, right? You've got to get him in there. Try to get uh try to get that swing going because of how much upside he has and and athletic ability and uh but but a guy that's taking reps at third base first base and even uh second base too uh can, can, can you imagine a guy that size covering second base but that's how ungodly athletic he is and how quick he is uh really strong arm and and when you put him out in left field um you know you have three guys that can really run down balls at that point with him off and then Trayson Hughes in right field, uh, which is just going to further give those pitchers confidence, the ones that everybody besides basically me and Chad Smith are worried about, right? So, uh, but but those guys keep them in the outfield and, and they can really cover some ground. Another guy that I think is not getting near enough publicity going into this year, who I thought was awesome for us as a true freshman, you brought him up a second ago, is Will Furness. Uh, a guy that just hits. He he's he's just a, a, a natural born hitter. He really came on towards uh, the the latter half of the SEC schedule. Got a lot more bats. Got a lot more comfortable. Uh, I think he ended up hitting two ninety eight as a true freshman in this league. I mean, come on, man. That there's not a lot of people that come in straight out of high school and you know almost hit three hundred in the SEC. Um, he's really focused. They, we we interviewed him. Uh, it was actually my first player interview on Dids in the Dugout and. His big thing is doubles. That's that's what he wants to do. He wants to hit, you know, two, three times more doubles than he did last year at least. And uh, and kind of like his dad said, when when you do stuff like that, then uh, home runs are just accidents, right? So you hope for more accidents at that point where it starts flying over the fence. But uh, a guy that just ha has a really level uh, a really level swing, makes really good contact, hits barrels on the ball, and and that's why the ball jumps off his bat the way it does. I think you'll see him mostly at DH. Uh, 
he'll spell Jackson Ross some at, at first base. There's talk of Jackson also playing some left field force. Look, you're going to see a lot of tinkering here in, in, in the non-con, probably the, the very beginning of SEC play, too. Mike always does it, and more so with this team. But but what should make you feel good and different about this team is he's doing it because he has that many dudes that he needs to see, not because he doesn't have somebody that can't do this or can't do this. Uh, he's got that much depth with the bats that, that he needs to see what the, the, the best starting nine is going to be and what the best uh, – lineup configuration is going to be but yeah will's going to figure into it uter mark's going to be really good uh another guy in left field that's a returner john kramer just has absolute power man i mean he he, he really hits the ball he's got i was excited about all throughout the off season then we start getting all these transfers in and but but kramer's still hitting the ball really well uh he hit one the other day i think went 460 in the inner squad come, come off at a 112 miles an hour or something like that so he had uh, three or four home runs last year and 49 at bat. So if, if if you can find a way to get him in the lineup, that's just another really, really plus uh, power bat in this lineup that's, that's just stacked full of them. So those are probably three guys I'm most excited about from a returning standpoint. Uh, and then I'll also mention Ethan Groff there in center field, a guy that really had a good career at Tulane before transferring into Ole Miss last year. Got off to a blazing hot start, right, uh, both at, at the plate and in the field. He's an incredible fielder, and, and that's what really kept him in the lineup throughout the entire year. He struggled come conference play, but now he's seen that, right? He's gone up against the best in the country. He's done it for a year. So now he gets back out in center field. You get a plus-plus defender in center field where you no longer have to worry about up-the-middle defense in the outfield, and uh, a guy that has a ton of potential both power and speed at the plate. I would expect to see him probably at least start the year leading off and, and at some point, uh, you know, probably cement himself as the leadoff hitter, I would guess. You know, give me a, um, a position player and a pitcher who you think is likely to surprise in 2024. Likely to surprise. Um, well, one name that I always get from a position player standpoint, uh, during my last, I'd say, three or four player interviews, this guy's been brought up uh, completely unprompted. I never asked about him, never brought, brought his name up, but each player brought brought him up themselves, and that was Braden Randall, uh, freshman out of Texas. Kind of has some Peyton Shotye vibes to me a little bit. Uh, really, really good defender, a guy that you can put out there at second uh, or come in and spell Luke Hill at shortstop when needed. But whenever he's on the field, you never have to worry about a ball getting past him. Has a plus arm, so... Uh, he he can play shortstop when you need it, and then when you get when you move that arm to second base, it becomes plus plus at that point. Uh, can can really throw out runners from anywhere at the second base position, no matter how how uh, hard he has to work to get to the ball. And just a contact hitter, right? Uh, you know he's he's a young guy, obviously true freshman coming into this league, but uh, you know puts the bat on the ball, makes contact, and if you do that enough times, good things are going to happen. It's uh Kind of the, like I say, kind of like Peyton Shaq, you know, he came in as a freshman, came out of nowhere and started his true freshman year, uh, you know, but I I, I was comparing more to Ethan Leje myself, though, because it doesn't sound like he ever strikes out, and, and that's, that, that's what Leje brings to the table. Uh, you know, when Leje gets up there, he's either going to hit into an out, get a hit, or he's going to walk. Uh, I think he struck out like six times all year last year, which is absolutely nuts, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Braden Randall's a guy that, that that always puts the bat on the ball, though. So I'm I'm expecting to see him definitely, uh, you know, at least a couple times over the weekend to just kind of see what it looks like. But I think you'll start seeing him more and more as the year goes on. And wouldn't be surprised if he cemented himself as the starting second baseman at some point if he plays up to the level he did in the fall and the spring. Um, and then uh, for the pitcher, God, man, I I could take. Uh, you know, 10 different guys at this point. Um, give me, uh, all right, I've already talked about Wes Mendez, so give me Riley Maddox. He's uh, he's going to be starting the Sunday game for us here in Hawaii, coming off Tommy John surgery. We saw uh, Riley a little bit last year. Things weren't going particularly well for the Rebels, obviously, by the time he made it back to the field. Um, but look, all, all credit to him, though. He he didn't sit out and take a red shirt and save a year of eligibility. He got back out on the mound, and, and he told Mike that he wanted to pitch. He wanted to compete. 
and he wanted to do whatever he could to help the Rebels win as many games as they could, even though the year wasn't going the way that they wanted to at that point. Uh, so Riley went out there, really battled. He wasn't quite himself. Velocity wasn't there. Uh, he, you could tell he really didn't have a feel for his slider like he did his freshman year, but that's to be expected. He's coming off Tommy John surgery. He, he had just worked his way back uh, to the point where he could get back on the mound in an in-game setting. So, uh, but now he's had a, a, a full off season after the Tommy John, after that little bit of experience, like he had five appearances last year. Um, and, and now he's in the starting rotation. And, uh, honestly, he's not, uh, didn't pay to, to be in the starting rotation after Revis went down. Uh, but, but then I started hearing rumblings of it from, from a couple of different players. And that's when I started paying a lot more attention to it, obviously at that point, uh, but, but Riley's a, a, a really talented guy. He, he was, you know, super talented his freshman year for us. He, he, he was the best freshman on our team at that point, but before he ended up getting hurt. So really excited to see what he's going to do, especially if, if, if starting pitcher is his new role. It's a completely different role. He, uh, he has a little bit of a, a, a funky delivery, not, not with all gyrations and stuff like that, but he comes from a lower three-quarters arm slot which you don't see a lot from starting pitchers. So that'll be something different for, for hitters to have to see. You know, usually you see a guy like that, uh, you know, one time per game, something like that, and he's out by the time the lineup uh, turns over. Uh, sounds like they're going to have to deal with that with Riley probably at least two times uh, a game. So it'll be interesting to see how, how hitters make their adjustments after seeing him the first time they make it up and, and he's still in the game the second time if, if they're able to adjust. and and uh, try to square up a ball on him, but he's he, he's a guy that's super hard to to get the barrel on, and that's why he's uh, probably been shoved into this Sunday roll four so far. That's kind of why I was saying I was ready to get to these three-game series to see how Mike was really going to settle it in if if Riley gets bumped out or if Gunner gets bumped out because we know Quinn and Sonia are both going to be in this weekend rotation. So season outlook for Ole Miss baseball. I mean, we haven't played a game yet, and there hasn't been a pitch thrown What's the season go? How's this year going to go? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty simple for me, man. Uh, here at Ole Miss, we we've set a standard, right? We have certain expectations. It doesn't matter if we have a bad year; those expectations just roll over to the next year. You go in, you get it fixed, you work your tail off, and then you come out the next year and uh, and then you achieve those goals. Those goals are pretty simple. Mike talked about them in his uh, press conference Friday at the media day. You uh, you try to win the conference host a regional, host a super regional, and then go on to Omaha and, and give it your best shot to win, try to win a national championship. Those you know, expectations, uh, they should, a national championship they should, was, they went to the Miami regional. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, they did. And yeah, yeah. And I, I know you're really pulling for a, for another South Florida regional so you can get down there and see them. Uh, you're going to be pretty disappointed, though, because I think the Rebels end up taking one of those top eight seeds, get to host a regional, Host of Super, look, I, I'm telling you, uh, nobody believes in this team, it seems like, from a national standpoint, but from a depth standpoint, I, I just don't see any way that, uh, you know, that, that we're not a 18 and 12 SEC record kind of kind of team this year. Uh, the pitching depth is, is just so, so much better than anything we've had in the last several years, including that national championship run we had. You know, it was that was every bit of Dylan DeLucia, and Hunter Elliott, and then a mixture of Jack Doherty, Mason Nichols, uh, Josh Mallets, and and Brandon Johnson for the most part. You know, you you would have guys like uh, John Gaddis come in to get you an out or two as a lefty specialist after he got bumped from the rotation. But, uh, you know, it was really just a handful of guys that we were able to ride all the way to that national championship. And that's not going to be the case this year. We've got uh, 10, 12 farms that are going to be able to collect outs for us. And, and that's, the, that's the goal every single game, get – get out number 27 with the lead. Uh, if you do that enough times, then you're obviously going to have a great year, and, and that's something we're set up to do. I think we're going to hit the stew out of the ball. The, these transfers look to be pretty good. A guy we haven't even talked about yet that uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw in, Campbell Smith with the freshman catcher out of Oxford High School. Uh, Mike called him probably the most impressive and talented freshman he's ever coached, which is saying something with yeah. the long line of catchers that, that we've had in Oxford to play at Swayze Field. Uh, Campbell's a guy that uh, just he, – he's a really, really good receiver, got a strong arm. He, he's really good behind the plate. But, man, he hits the fire out of the ball, too. He's uh, 
He's a big lefty up there. Uh, has has hit a ton of bombs. Makes a lot of contact. He's he's not he's not one of those power guys that's going to go up there and swing for the fence or strike out. He's not a two outcome hitter, which is uh, obviously a big deal. But but the main thing for him is his duties behind the plate, controlling this pitching staff. That uh, you know while while they have experience, they are still young, and he's young too. So they're going to be able to learn and grow together. But Campbell Smith was a guy that uh, uh, that y'all need to keep y'all's eye on. Uh, Got freshman All American written all over him, potential All SEC type player uh, as a freshman. And I know I, I know that sounds like high praise, uh, but he, he is that talented. So uh, again, just a, a team with a ton of guys, uh, both at the plate and on the mound. That uh, you know, I think hosting a regional, hosting a super, and getting back to Omaha should be the expectation. It's my expectation. That's my outlook for it. And uh, that's what I, what I will expect until uh, hopefully they don't, but until proven otherwise. Thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Derek Vandegrift, thank you so much. That was the Ole Miss baseball season preview. It's here, finally. Now, don't stay up too late Friday night. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm I'm gonna make it all the way through Friday night and into Saturday morning. You're you're liable to wake up to to an impromptu uh, instant overreaction to a Friday night game or something like that. Who knows? Yeah. Hey, outstanding. Anyway, take care, buddy, and uh, we'll talk to you each week during the course of the season. All right, bud. Hi, toddy. Hotty toddy.